First, the curiosity question. Yes. <laughs> Who are you? What's your history? Yeah. How did you get to work at the New York Times? So I actually joined the New York Times in 2016. I had worked for a variety of news organizations and covered a variety of issues for 20 years. And um, as I progressed in my career, had done more and more reporting, uh, investigative reporting. In fact, reporting on sex crimes uh, and, and sexual misconduct. I had, as a reporter in Chicago, I had done stories about women who had been sexually abused by their doctors who went on, continued to practice even when they reported them to police and prosecutors. Uh, I had reported on uh, women who had, you know, suffered, been victims of sex crimes and seen the DNA, the rape kits collected from them, shelved and you know, left in storage facilities and police departments. Uh, and so I had also, so I had really done a fair amount of reporting on this sort of admittedly depressing topic, but I had done so with more and more evidence that this type of reporting could make a real difference. Some of the doctors that I wrote about after we did the stories were convicted and sent to prison. Uh, there were new laws that were passed to bring all of those rape kits out of police storage. And so I came into the New York Times in 2016 with a real conviction that this type of reporting could make a difference. And I actually was assigned to cover the presidential race and to be one of the investigative reporters digging into the presidential candidates. And within uh, a couple weeks uh, uh, on the job, I got my first assignment to cover Donald Trump's treatment of women. And so I actually ended up doing some of the, I, I told some of the first stories of women who came forward with allegations of sexual misconduct against then candidate Trump. And I can let me tell you that was a completely different experience than the Weinstein reporting and the reporting that I had done before. Uh, you know, I was the one on the phone, often the one on the phone, encouraging these women to go on the record, saying these stories can help make a difference and can help inform the public understanding of the within this really important presidential race. And while some of these women did, in fact, uh, receive public support and appreciation, they also suffered tremendous attacks. Attacks. Trump called them liars, he threatened to sue them, he called them ugly, his supporters swung into action and attacked them. He threatened to sue me, he threatened to sue the New York Times, and when I called him to seek comment before we published these allegations, he screamed at me and called me a disgusting human being. And so um, it was, I, and then I helped cover his election. And so I will confess that going into 2017, I was feeling pretty bad. <laughs> and wondering whether or not this type of reporting could make a difference. But weren't you also angry? Or, or <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you know, I think that I mean, you, you had reported on this man mm -hmm. and he became the president. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, I think it was interesting. The day of the election, I was actually dispatched to Hillary Clinton's hometown uh, to, to gather the stories and comments of women who were going in and out of the polling place to vote. Uh, and, and, you know, for a story that we suspected was going to be about the first woman being elected president of the United States and how women felt about that. And within two hours of reporting, I messaged my editors and said, half of these women are voting for Trump. And that was a really, really significant moment for me. I, you know, I went, flew back to New York that night and I arrived home and my husband and some of my friends were gathered around the TV watching the results. And just, I kind of knew deep down in the pit of my stomach what the result was likely to be. I could see it. I had encountered it, not just in the faces of people coming in and out of the polling places, but the actual, some of these suburban female voters. So for me, that was also a wake-up call. And you can't stop these voters and say, have you read my stories? Uh, you know, are, have you paid attention to the now more than 10 women who have come forward with uh, allegations of sexual misconduct against Trump? You can't say that. And you can't, you don't go around as a reporter wearing your opinions or your feelings on your sleeve. But, but have you, do you have any explanation? Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. I remember uh, the, the pussy grabbing uh, story. Mm -hmm. And I thought, okay, now he's finished. Mm -hmm. the, the, the Yankees are so Christian, mm -hmm. they will never take mm -hmm. this. 
Well, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting. Our book starts with the reporting that I did on Trump and then transitions into the Weinstein investigation and then goes through to Christine Blasey Ford testifying about Brett Kavanaugh and how that played out. Uh, and one of the things that's been pretty consistent is that when allegations are made in the political realm, uh, it often quickly descends into holy war with both sides taking up arms against each other and sometimes the women almost being forgotten. And I think that's been the case whether it was Kavanaugh, whether it was Trump, whether it was Bill Clinton. Um, but I think in the case, obviously, we're going to be trying to, we're sort of seeking to unpack this, what's kind of unique to the Trump presidency and his supporters and why so many things that have, you know, been, that, that, that would stick with somebody else just don't seem to stick to him. Okay. We fast forward. Mm -hmm. You had your baby. Yes, I did. That's right. And then you were asked, you told us, uh, could you maybe cover some allegations or rumors about Harvey Weinstein? Did you know who Harvey Weinstein was? Mm -hmm. You know, I actually, I will confess, I really did not know who Harvey Weinstein was. In fact, there was a moment several years before where I had um, received a, an award at the White House Correspondents' Dinner in Washington uh, and was sitting at a table next to a large man uh, who was receiving a lot of attention. There just seemed to be all the famous actors and actresses and uh, at least notable figures in the audience were kind of making a beeline up to his table to wait in line to talk to him. And I turned to somebody next to me and I said, who is this guy and uh, it was it was it was an actor and he said oh that's that's Harvey Weinstein and I said I don't I don't know who Harvey Weinstein is uh, I was really not a reporter who was steeped in the entertainment industry I had never covered it as we mentioned when we started this reporting I had no idea who I mean try, we didn't know any actresses I mean we didn't know how to get in touch with any of these people where well, we were really starting at zero but we were starting with a promise you know, there was something that happened between Trump's election and the launch of the Weinstein investigation. Our colleagues broke the story of Bill O'Reilly in the spring of 2017, and I know that that may now seem that like that was 100 sexual harassment stories ago, um, but at the time it was actually a really big deal. Our colleagues showed, ultimately were able to show in the pages of the New York Times, that Bill O'Reilly, the most famous and powerful media figure in conservative media, he and Fox News had ultimately paid off more than $40 million to women who had come forward with allegations of sexual misconduct against him. And when that story was published, listen, it wasn't, Fox knew what was going on. His employer knew what was going on. They were involved in some of the payoffs. But what happened when those allegations were printed in the pages of the New York Times was truly remarkable. Advertisers revolted at Fox. Basically, they said, we're going to yank our advertising money if you allow this guy to stay on air. So Bill O'Reilly was ousted from his job. I mean, he had been, and something that nobody thought would ever happen. And we at the New York Times took notice of that and asked what may now seem like a really quaint question, which was, you know, are there other powerful men who have abused women and covered their tracks? And so that was the launch, that was, and, and Harvey Weinstein had long been rumored, um, at least people who knew him, um, had long been aware of these rumors about him preying on actresses. And so we at the New York Times took this moment to say, okay, we're going to throw some resources, not just at reporting on Harvey Weinstein. We had reporters who were going into Silicon Valley, who were going into the restaurant industry, who were going into academia, who were going into car factories in Chicago. We really, in 2017, made a broad commitment to covering sexual harassment, not really knowing how any of the stories were going to pan yeah, out. You also did the Bill Cosby, the New York mm -hmm. Times, mm -hmm. the, the huge right. showing of all the faces of women yeah. who had been uh, abused. Yeah, by Cosby. Our, our colleagues at New York Magazine had done that memorable cover. But you're right. There was listen. There were some signs. There was the there were some signs that things might be shifting. And you know, even with Trump, even after he was elected, yes, he was elected. But there were also thousands and thousands of people who took to the streets on inauguration with their pink hats, their pink pussy hats to protest, basically out in the streets saying, no, we do care about this issue. It is important. This is not acceptable. So we did, the stage was starting to be set. Okay, um, so you started. Wait, yeah, that's and, right. And what then? I mean, you don't know any actresses. You don't know who Harvey Weinstein is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, how did you start? Yeah, so we started with um, our first secret source with, was 
the actress Rose McGowan. Uh, she had, in 2016, as women who were coming forward with allegations against Trump, she was among the women who came who basically went on social media and she wrote a tweet in which she basically described being allegedly raped by a powerful producer. And she didn't name Harvey Weinstein, but there was a sense that that's who she was talking about. And so, you know, Jody, I was on maternity leave, but Jody reached out to Rose McGowan and at first she refused to talk. She said, you work for a sexist newspaper. I'm not going to, you know, there's no way I'm going to talk to you guys. Um, but she, you know, she did in fact open up and it was the first, she was the first source to tell her story off the record um, of being preyed upon by Weinstein in a hotel room when she was starting off um, in the early 90s. And uh, within a couple, within like the next month or so, Gwyneth Paltrow and Ashley Judd were telling very similar stories themselves. And these were three women who, three very different actresses, they didn't know each other, they weren't friends. And that was, in these hushed secret conversations with those three actresses were the first indications that there was a there there and a story to pursue. And after them, you found out it wasn't only actresses. Mm -hmm. In fact, it was mostly lower employees. Yeah, that's right. So there was, right, exactly. So how did it go on? Because mm -hmm. how did you find them or did mm -hmm. the women come to you? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there were, you're right, there was, as we continued to report, there was a second category of alleged victims that started to come into focus. These were young women who had gone to work for Weinstein's companies, often right, time, right after college, you know, in their early 20s. If you wanted to work in Hollywood, if you wanted to work in the entertainment industry, and you got a job working for Harvey Weinstein, it was your ticket in. Uh, people were, it was just common understanding that if you could go and work for Weinstein and survive, you were going to be able to basically have a pathway say, into the entertainment say, and, industry. And survive, so everybody knew? Everybody knew that it was a general, it, they, what was very openly discussed was a broader culture of sort of abusive uh, behavior um, and just a, a basically like a, a, a boss who had could sort of swing in temperament from being kind to being uh, lashing out. And so there was, that was widely discussed, that was widely known. Um, but what we realized through, you know, as we continued our reporting was that some many of the these young women had their own stories of, of sexual predation, that they too had come in, like the actresses who had showed up for meetings and who had been oftentimes told by their agents to report to hotel rooms for meetings, for work meetings with Harvey Weinstein, only to have him sort of turn their work ambitions against them, that the same thing had happened to a lot of these young women who had worked as assistants and junior executives in his company. But even as this whole other category of victims came into view, we also realized that many of these women were legally prohibited from speaking to us. So, you know, this... Which, which means they, they got an amount of money providing they would never speak about it. Right. So this happens, and this happens in sexual harassment and sexual assault cases every single day. Women will after they've sort of experienced a violation, they will go to an attorney seeking advice because they want to do something about it. They want to hold that person accountable. And oftentimes they are told that their best, if not only option, is to accept money in exchange for silence. And why do lawyers do that? Well, I, listen, I think that what the lawyers will tell you is that, listen, if you want to go to court, if you want to file a public complaint and go into the court system, that's going to be a really long road and there's no guarantee guarantee that you're going to win. And along the way, you're going to have to open yourself up to attack by the perpetrator who's likely going to go to great lengths to smear you. And if you want privacy, if you want this thing to go away, if you want to receive financial recompense for what's happened to you, the best thing to do is to accept this money in exchange for silence. And we sort of knew the vague, you know, we knew the outlines of some of these secret settlements. We weren't shocked, completely shocked that there had been secret settlements that had paid. But as we did our reporting, the restrictive clauses that we encountered made our jaws drop. So, for example, I told you the story about the sort of patient zero of the Weinstein investigation, this woman who in 1990 had been allegedly sexually assaulted by Weinstein and then silenced through a secret settlement and had disappeared from the entertainment industry, never to emerge again, who had n and it had never spoken out about it. Well, there were other women that we, that were starting to come into view. There were other women who had worked in his companies, you know, just 
six or seven years later who had been silenced through secret settlements following very troubling encounters in hotel rooms. And when we started to basically see some of the restrictive clauses, these women had to turn over all evidence of what happened to them. They couldn't tell their colleagues about what had happened. They couldn't tell their family members. If they wanted to see a therapist, the therapist had to sign a confidentiality clause. And when a reporter came knocking, they, you know, they certainly, they, you know, they would suffer financial penalties many, if they told the truth about what had happened. Many times to them. they couldn't have the, the, the paperwork. Yeah. So they what could, do you do? The, you, you are a reporter. Mm -hmm. You want witnesses, victims, but and they have been bought off, and they don't have even have. Mm -hmm. Their paperwork. They don't even, right, they don't even, right, they don't even have the papers. And there was, you know, in the case of the woman from 1990, you know, she was, you know, she was terrified to speak out. And there was another, one of these other women, Jody went, actually traveled out to California. She got on an airplane and went to California to try to track her down. And she showed up in the driveway of this woman's house. And the woman wasn't there, but her husband was there. And so Jody starts talking to him and saying, I'm from the New York Times. We are working on this story about Harvey and West Harvey Weinstein, I have reason to believe that your wife may have been victimized by him. And, she, and he said, you know, I don't know what you're talking about. And she's thinking, well, this sounds like, this is basically sounds like something that somebody would say as part of a settlement. And, and you know, so she kept talking. She's like, I have reason to believe that she may have, your wife may have been paid a settlement. And the man gestured to the house behind him and said, do I look like somebody whose wife just received, you know, has received a big settlement? And Jody is listening to him talk, and it's starting to dawn on her, oh my God, he doesn't know. This woman's own husband does not know what happened to her when she was just starting her career. Still, you want to write, you want to report. What do you do? Mm -hmm. How do you make victims talk to you? Mm -hmm. And in the end, even on the record. Yeah. Well, what we realized... What we realized early on, so there's two things that happen. There's kind of two phases of investigative reporting. There's the determining whether or not there's a there there, if there's a story to pursue. You're kind of selling your editors on the idea, like you're asking them to give you time and resources, sort of promising that it's going to be worth their while. And along the way, you have to check in. You kind of have to report back on what you found. And, you know, two and a half, three months into the investigation, our editor, Rebecca Corbett, took Jody and I out for drinks one night in Midtown Manhattan, and we spelled out for her everything we knew. We were like, we were talking to all these actresses. They're telling us the exact same stories. Uh, there's a real pattern of predation that's coming into focus. We think he's paid off all these settlements. And she said, how many women are on the record? And we said, none. And she said, how, you know, how many of these settlements have you been able to prove or nail down or obtain records for? And we said, none. And she said, well, you don't have a publishable story. No. And so we realized that we were not going to, it was a real wake up call for us. We realized, I think we had had this, you know, as I mentioned, we had had this kind of hope that at some point all of these actresses would join hands and say, okay, we're gonna make this leap together. And we realized as we went on that that was not going to happen. Um, you know, there was one day where we drove, we, where Jody and I drove out to Gwyneth Paltrow's house. She'd been telling us her story by phone, and now we were talking to her in person. And we re were really hoping that she was going to get ready to go on the record with us. And you know, she had even been helping us in other ways. She was calling around to other women in Hollywood to see if they had stories for us. At one point, when we were sitting in her backyard, she stepped away to take a phone from another famous actress to say, you know, do you have uh, Harvey Weinstein story. I've got a couple of reporters here in my backyard, and um, you know they. The, and so she was really. You could tell that she cared. You could tell that she was invested. But even in that afternoon, in her you know sort of Nobody. sunny backyard, she said, "I'm you know I don't I you know I can't be the only one." Nobody wanted to do make the leap by themselves, and understandably so. So we realized midway through the summer that if we waited around, we were never going to be able to publish the story if we were just waiting for women to go on the record. Oh, and that's when we went in pursuit of the financial. That's when we really started to like dig in our heels and try to and started to work to nail down the financial trail of payoffs. We had learned from the, you know our colleagues who had broke the Bill O'Reilly story, 
it used to be as a reporter, if you were, you know, if you were wading into a particular subject and you came across these secret settlements, it was like a sign to pack up your bag and go home. You'd say like, okay, there's, uh, this is, uh, this is, this is an insurmountable challenge. I'm not going to be able to do this story. Case closed. But what our colleagues had shown in the Bill O'Reilly story was that these secret settlements that had long been used to cover up misconduct, if you could basically piece together the financial trail of those payoffs, it could help illuminate misconduct. You know, readers weren't, didn't have to, didn't, didn't there wasn't really any question once they saw that the, the, that O'Reilly had paid off so many of these secret settlements over the years. So we set about trying to piece together the financial trail in, in the case of Weinstein. So you had to have proof. We had to have proof, yes. Yes. And still you, you had to have witnesses, victims talking to you. Mm -hmm. How did you convince them mm -hmm, mm -hmm. to talk to you? Yeah, it, w it was not easy. Listen, when you show up on the doorstep of somebody and to... to that, that was the strategy, just show up. No, sometimes it was. That, that's actually the strategy of last resort. Before we show up on somebody's doorstep unannounced, we're going to be reaching out by phone, by email, sometimes through family members or friends or trusted colleagues. And so, but we... Listen, there's so many reasons not to talk to a reporter. Uh, when we came knocking either by phone or literally um, on somebody's doorstep, we understood that we were a often asking these people to open up about the most painful experience in their life. And even the powerful actresses were terrified of Harvey Weinstein. His power and influence was so great that they were, that they would be the ones to suffer damage to their careers if they spoke out. And so, and you know, they had done nothing wrong to become victims of sexual harassment and sexual abuse. They had basically shown up to work with like big work, you know, professional ambitions. And that's what they were guilty of. And yet they were, so, you know, there was also, it, it, in some ways, it even feels unfair that we have to ask these women to like go out on a limb and put themselves and take yet another risk to do this yet, work. Yet you made them. You so we would make, and yet we would, so the case that we had made was to say, listen, we can't change what's happened to you, but if you work with us and we're able to publish the truth, we might be able to protect other people. We might be able to turn your private pain towards some constructive public use. And I think that that really clicked for a lot of people. When we first started our Weinstein investigation, we thought that we were kind of doing like a historical corrective, what really happened behind the scenes about, you know, of these Oscar winning movies in the 1990s. But as our investigation went on, we started to realize that Weinstein was engaging in alleged predation, sometimes at the same, exact same hotel as he had in the 1990s, as recently as 2000. 2015. Um, you know, there ended up being um, a deep throat figure in our investigation. Yes, tell, tell, tell us about him. Yeah, Harvey Weinstein's corporate accountant of 30 years, Erwin Ryder, was somebody who in 2014 and 2015, as he was watching the Bill O'Reilly, excuse me, as he was watching the Bill Cosby story unfold, started to think, oh my God, I think we may have a Bill Cosby problem here at the Weinstein Company. And so he was, and he was concerned. He tried to do something about it. He tried to confront Weinstein. He tried to slip information to members of the board, the company's board, but all of his efforts to hold Weinstein accountable failed. And so when we came knocking in 2017, he made the choice to basically ultimately slip us internal company records in which women at the company as recently as 2015 were documenting serious allegations of sexual harassment harassment and abuse by Weinstein. And so that was the moment when we got those internal records where we thought, oh my goodness, this, the, the moral stakes of this investigation have just shot through the roof. Where this isn't a his, just a historical corrective. You know, this is somebody who seems to be continuing to harm people. And if we're not able to publish the truth, he's very likely going to go on to harm more people. So when we came back to women, to you know, we'd been talking, having these hushed conversations with sources for months. And once we got that internal com those internal company records, and once we had, at that point, we were starting to realize that Weinstein had made as many as 12 secret settlements, stretching from 1990 to 2015, we went back to these people and said, listen, you know, the stakes of this investigation have gotten higher. You know, we're not just asking you to go on the record to, to explain what happened to you all these years ago. Um, we are really working to bring to light what who we now consider to be an active sexual predator. You, were, you are a reporter, but you're also a human being. 
so how how emotionally involved did you get? Mm -hmm. I mean, did you <clears throat> ever cry? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, have I cried in the course of, of reporting? Uh, yes, I have. I will. Uh, I will admit. And of course, this is emotional. Of course, this work is emotional. And you know, Jody and I wouldn't be reporting on these issues of sexual harassment or sexual assault if we didn't really care about them. And we have worked with so many. We have now, you know, sort of three years in. Um, sat down at tables like this with so many women who have opened up to us about these really painful experiences. And so while we have, of course, been moved by those stories, um, we also have worked to maintain um, a professional relationship and distance. I mean, we are not, we always stress that we are not you know, we are not these women's friends, we are not their therapists, we are not their advocates, we are journalists, and we often feel like the best thing that we can do to help, um, as we've sort of waded into this river of pain, that the best thing that we can do is to do our jobs as journalists well. And what that looks like is saying, okay, we're not just going to listen to your story here and, 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 and get emotional about it, but we're going to go out and we're going to seek our corroboration. We're going to do other types of due diligence to make sure that your story is as airtight as possible. And we're going to also be continue, we're also going to be out there accumulating um, and working to obtain other evidence, a whole mountain of evidence, so that if you do decide to go on the record, you're going to be doing this in a like in an airtight, extremely solid story. That's what we can bring to the table. And at the same time that you were working, there was another reporter working, mm. Ronan Farrow. And he was kind of fishing in the same pond. Mm -hmm. How was it for you? When did you uh, realize mm -hmm. that? Well, we, we had heard that Ronan Farrow was investigating Weinstein for NBC um, in the summer of 2017. The television call. Yeah. The, yeah um, for, and we, but we had also heard that other journalists had been reporting on Weinstein, um, a reporter at New York Magazine, um, other, even reporters at the New York Times had tried and failed to, to get this story. And so we paid attention, but we didn't let it kind of rule our emotions or certainly our appro approach to the reporting. There were no shortcuts, as we you, realized. You weren't getting nervous. We were, yeah, we were paying attention, but then we heard that he had been, we had heard that that, that that story had come to a halt and that he was no longer working with NBC News. And so it wasn't until the end of the summer that some of our sources started getting calls from a fact checker at the New Yorker. Um, saying that for a story that Ronan Farrow was doing for the and New that's Yorker. How you how you found out. <laughs> and that's and where where yeah, and once our editor, Dean Baquet, who's an ex who's very, very competitive, um, I mean we all are. I mean any journalist who says that she's not competitive is lying to you. Um, but once we heard that we really we re we realized there's a moment in investigations where you could report and report and report. And we knew at that point obviously we had seen like we had seen this much of the story, <laughs> and we had about this much of this this much of the story um, we were nailing down, and so that was the moment where when we realized that the New Yorker was on our trail, that Dean Baquet said, "Our you know like all right, troops, like we're gonna let's let's see if we can let, let's see if we can bring this slice of the story onto the record and, because yeah, not, and yeah, be the first and be the first because whoever gets to the pr publishing first is gonna kind of." put a flag down and you know I'm sure that the that there will be other information that spills out but it's really important given how much hard work that you've done and that's still we still it, was, it wasn't until two weeks later that we were able to publish the story I mean we weren't there we still had to go through extreme due diligence at the end including going to Harvey Weinstein for response which turned into a complete roller coaster <laughs> unto itself um, that we had to sort of survive before getting to the finish line but it uh, there, yeah it was a factor it was certainly Ronan Farrell as a factor in us speeding up our timeline. Before we go into the, into the story of you and Weinstein, <laughs> is there anyone in the audience who wants to ask a question already? We have a microphone standing here. If not, we are going on. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. This might not be this might not be the right moment to ask it, but maybe you can save it for later. Um, I saw a fragment of an interview 
or a conversation with you and Bob Woodward, I oh, think, yeah. on Twitter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it was just a fragment, and it was really... Um, you articulated brilliantly the difference between power and sex, and he kept going, yeah, but it's about sex, you're going, it's about power, and it's that... Mm -hmm. So maybe at some point yeah. you can... Yeah, well, maybe you can tell about it now. We wanted to discuss this, but it, it is... It, it's way yeah. on, everything is almost right. over. Yes. And, uh, we, 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 will get, and I, we will get to we will get to that. I think we should now. I th yeah, okay, we, no, I'm happy to. I mean, so yeah. when we Jody and Megan were compared to Woodward and Bernstein. The we were compared to yes, we yeah. So they were interviewed by Bob Woodward from the Watergate investigation. Mm -hmm. uh, the old president man man mm -hmm. and uh, you can all look it up on youtube mm -hmm. it's there and it's a very strange conversation mm -hmm. between you yeah you and jody and bob woodward yeah, yeah it was the first it was i think it was it was the second live interview that we did much like this and we were on stage with bob woodward we had asked him to moderate we knew him we had spoken to his journalism class and he was a huge huge supporter of the book i mean he called it a masterpiece he said he was going to teach it in his class so when he stepped on the stage with us he was kind of arriving as a friend of the book and um but as the interview went on the crowd got pretty upset with him um you know, not only, not only did he cut us off when we were answering his questions, which was something that did not go over well with a crowd that had come to listen to two authors talk about a book called She Said. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> he did become very fixated on this question of why Harvey Weinstein did what he did and what his sort of sexual motivations were. And we tried to handle that question as delicately as possible, um, pointing out that we felt like there were much more significant pressing passive reporting to pursue outside of really working to dissect all of Harvey Weinstein's psychology. Um, and also pointing out that, that it, it's often a misperception that this is about, so often we would talk to people who had encountered Weinstein over the years and gotten glimpses of the problem and convinced themselves that he was just like a, a sex addict, including his own brother Bob Weinstein, who granted us you know, these series of interviews for our book. You know, even in 2000, we published this pleading letter that Bob wrote to his brother in 2015, two years before everything spilled into light, but at a time when more and more things were coming into view for Bob. And he's, he's basically saying, you need to get treatment for sex addiction. And I think that that was just one of many people, and maybe, maybe this applies more, we've gotten these questions more from men of a certain generation who also seem to be under the impression that, you know, that it's only unattractive men who engage in and sexual harassment or rape that there's that there's somehow this um, you know that this that, that this really is about sort of desperate attempts at sex as opposed to an abuse of power and so listen I I, I can't, I'm not up here on the stage saying that I have all the answers to the to Bob Woodward's question but but there was no there was no doubt that as he kind of pressed and pressed and pressed and pressed on that one specific question, really trying to figure out, like at one point he had even used the term sexual foreplay um, in one of his questions that the, that the largely female audience got increasingly angry. And so we understand why, but we also don't want men to, it, you know, this, this made headlines the next day, we were asked to comment, even Bob Woodward's own Washington Post did a story about this, and we understand why, um, and, but we also want to, we also feel really strong Strongly that we don't want anybody to be excluded from this really important conversation. We don't want men to feel like they can't uh, they can't ask the questions that are on their mind or that they you know that they that, that they genuinely have and are grappling with. We don't want men to be sidelined, and so we also just continue to be very grateful that Woodward did do that interview with us. And if it was more, if it brought out feelings and forced. Uh, force people to kind of confront assumptions that they have about some of this behavior all the better. That's the way we saw it. <laughs> You're very generous. <laughs> <laughs> Back to the meeting with Weinstein. Oh, yes, right. So how did it go? Did he just... 
he tried to telephone your uh, editor in chief several times mm -hmm. because they knew each other. Right. Why? Yeah. So this is one of the things that Harvey Weinstein had done time and time again. I think at other news organizations. And so when we were working with sources, there, we were sometimes talking to sources who had spoken to other reporters. They had actually found the courage to work with other reporters only to see those stories killed. And so they they were pretty they were pretty upset about that. And they would say, listen, why should I talk to you? Why should I have faith that this story is ever going to be published, even if you are able to get the you know, get to the bottom of the truth here. And, you know, what we would say is, listen, we can't tell you what's happened in other news organizations, but, you know, if, like, the only thing that the only thing that's going to get killed here is us if we don't come back with the goods. Like our editors are going to be very upset. They put a lot of effort and resources into this investigation. We have the support all the way up through the top. But that doesn't mean that Harvey Weinstein didn't try to go that route. I mean, he was very used to kind of marching into the top office or you know the the boss's 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 boss and saying, let's have a sort of. A, a, a conversation, important man to important man, and Going but like I'm just yeah, you know, and and he did try to do that with the publisher of the New York Times. He did try to do that with the executive editor, and it's worth noting not only was he sort of powerful and and intimidating and bullying, but he also was an advertiser of the New York Times. He he had spent his companies had spent a lot of money on advertising and the New York Times. But they're, to their credit, the the publisher um, Arthur Sulzberger and the executive editor Dean Baquet did not take his calls. They basically said, "Listen, you know, we don't have any time to talk to you, Harvey. If you want to talk to anybody, talk to the reporters." So he talked to you. And to Joe. Right. So ultimately, he talked to us at the very end. We really worked hard to, to, we did not want to, we were really reluctant to engage with him. We didn't, we made a pretty fast rule at the beginning of our investigation that we would not talk to Harvey Weinstein off the record. We suspected, we, we knew that he was probably engaged in a variety of underhanded tactics to try to stop us. Uh, we didn't know that it included these, you know, former Israeli intelligence officials, um, but we suspected that there was, you know, there had been a moment where Dean Bakay had pulled us into his office and said, assume you're being trailed by private investigators, talk like every conversation is being recorded. Um, so we knew, we knew that we had to really be on the, on, on the lookout for any sort of underhanded tactics that he was going to use. So we didn't want to engage with him in off-the-record conversations because we knew that he was just going to abuse that privilege and try to probably smear the women or do other things that would put us in a difficult position. But when, at the end of our, you know, at the end of our reporting, as part of the final due diligence you do in an investigation like that, you have, have to. to go to the subject. Um, you have to give them adequate time. You have to spell out everything that you're preparing to publish about them. You have to give them adequate time to respond to every single thing that you're intending to say about them. You do that. You do that in the name of fairness. You do that in the name of accuracy. And for us, that really set off. We gave Weinstein 48 hours to respond. And that really set off probably the most dramatic 48 hours of the entire investigation because two things happened. One, all of our sources, all of the, especially the name sources, were sitting ducks for 48 hours. So we knew that Harvey Weinstein was likely going to try to come after, and his enablers were going to try to come after those people. We also knew that he was going to try to come after us. And sure enough, you know, he, his high-priced lawyers came in and they threatened to sue us. We now know that these private investigators were also working on his behalf to try to stop us. And the day before the st story was published, we got a call from one of his lawyers saying, Harvey Weinstein's on his way to the New York Times. He'll be there in five minutes. And we said, uh, well, I'm sorry, Harvey Weinstein's on his way to the New York Times right now, uninvited. Um, and we had to debate whether or not to, to take the meeting. We had been at that point just engaging with him and his lawyers on telephone calls. And so Jody and I took a second and you know, de debated what to do. And I said, you know, I'll take this meeting. Um, uh, you know, at this point, Harvey Weinstein was showing us who he was and what he was made of. And sure enough, when he came into the New York Times, he had that famous feminist attorney, Lisa Bloom, by his yeah. side. He had another famous feminist attorney by his side and another extremely powerful defense attorney. He did have folders of information about some of the women who were going to be in our story, information from their backgrounds, photos of them that he thought could be used to undermine them and their credibility. And so anyway, they, he came in and I took him, 
I escorted him into the, basically the middle of the newsroom into a big glass, actually a small glass conference room so that everybody who was walking by in the could newsroom see could you. see these guys. And I said, you've got 15 minutes, not a minute more. And I listened to them politely. And one of the reasons that I took this meeting is I, you know, I was like, listen, you're showing us what you're made of. Well, I want you to see what we're made of. I want you to come in here and sit down toe to toe with us and see that we're not gonna be intimidated, we're not gonna be bullied, and we're not gonna fall for these smear tactics. And weren't you intimidated? I, no. No? No, in fact, we were galvanized. The more that he used these, all of these underhanded, The more that he used these underhanded tactics, the more determined that we were. We were said, like, listen, we can't let, you know, the more that he did the bullying and the threatening and the intimidation, the more convinced and, and, and just certain we were that we had to, we just had to get to the finish line. We had to publish the story. <laughs> and so you've, you published it. And it had a huge uh, explosive quality after that, mm -hmm. you know. And one of the, the things was Woody Allen writing in the New York Times, uh, an essay about a witch hunt that was on its way. Mm -hmm. Your reporting and the subsequently uh, exploding of the Me Too. Mm -hmm. In how far did it get a witch hunt? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, one thing's for sure, which is that we did not have any, we, we had no clue what was coming. I mean, we suspected that Weinstein was going to Basically, I suspected that he was going to be ousted from his company. I didn't think that he'd survive. But in terms of what the broader impact of the story was, we certainly never imagined that the story would help fuel and ignite this Me Too movement, the hashtag that had been started by Tarana Burke in 2006. In fact, two nights before the story was published, Jody and I had been working around the clock in the middle of this insane 48-hour period. And it was about one o'clock in the morning and we said, we turned to each other and said, okay, we got it. We have to go home and get some sleep um, and come back to the office the next morning. And so we shared a cab from uh, Midtown Manhattan to Brooklyn. We live about 10 blocks from each other in Brooklyn. And in the sort of hushed silence of the cab, we finally turned to each other and said, do you think anybody's going to read this story? <laughs> We were so immersed in the story at that point. We were so completely enveloped by the reporting and, and sort of, you know, doing whack-a-mole with all of Weinstein's underhanded tactics that we hadn't really contemplated what would happen next. And so when we published that button on the publish button on um, October 5th at one o'clock, we kind of held our breaths and, and, and just waited to see what was going to happen next. And within, I think it was within three days, well, not only did we kind of hold our breaths, not only were we holding our breaths, we were continuing to report. I mean, we didn't, we didn't miss a beat. We went right back into reporting. What did the company know? When did it know it? Who were the other people who enabled this behavior? What, you know, what did the talent agencies know when they were sending actresses into these meetings at hotel rooms? So we continued to report. But within, I'd say, three or four days, I mean, our, our story was published on a Thursday. Weinstein was fired from his company on Sunday. Um, and within several days of that, our phones and emails were flooded with women who were coming forward with their own allegations, you know, with their own stories of abuse and ha harassment, not just against Weinstein, but from all different industries, women from all different backgrounds. And it was the first indication we had that something, if there had been signs that things were shifting up until then, th that was when we were like, oh, wow, things are really, something's really happening here. There's a real shift that's underway. And so we, you know, once again, we, our, our response to that, we almost had to do like a triage system in the New York Times, we could not keep up with the tips that were flooding in. And it really became a group project across all the different departments, the business section, the culture desk, the sports desk. There were reporters pulled in from all different parts of the paper to keep up with the, like, you know, with the, with this sort of tsunami of tips that were coming to, to us. And it didn't just happen at the New York Times. It happened in news organizations across the United States and, and ultimately around the world. Yeah. And so, you know, there was the journalism that took place as the Me Too movement ignited. There were also obviously people who just went straight to social media. You know, there was one night where I came home from work and flipped open my laptop and clicked on Facebook and was scrolling through and seeing for the first time fr my friends, my family members, you know, colleagues from uh, you know, my jobs in, in the past 
going on, you know, doing the Me Too hashtag and sharing their own story straight onto social media. And as somebody who had worked to, to basically unearth these stories and try to pry them into the light, to see them just flooding, flooding. into the public, you know, into public view, I mean, it, you know, it brought tears to my eyes scrolling through my Facebook that night. And so um, there, was, there was no question that something unprecedented was happening. And we continued to report. And it's one of the reasons that we wrote the book. It would have been really easy for us to finish on that triumphant moment when we did press publish and the story went out and our and all of the phones started ringing at the New York Times. Um, that would have been a really sort of nice and tidy way to finish, but we really reported into the year that followed as the Me Too movement became more complicated and confusing to yeah. people and as there, you know, a backlash emerged. And there's always this, this question of proof. There is no proof. Mm -hmm. there is, how do you deal with that as a, as a, as a reporter? Mm -hmm. You kept on reporting, you wrote this book, mm -hmm. and it's all the time people, she said, people telling something and then. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So maybe our legal system isn't working. Is that mm -hmm. something mm -hmm. you... Well, I think that there's no question that journalism, that, that the sort of that Me Too was an example of journalism stepping in where other institutions had failed. Yeah. I mean, Harvey Weinstein came to the, you know, came to the attention of police. He came to the attention of the board of his company. He came to the attention of the HR department. Um, he came to the attention of the criminal justice system. And none of, they did nothing. They, they didn't do anything to stop him. And so... But one I, has the idea also from your book that he... he on, behalf, on his behalf, the police was bought off, or something happened, or mm. people higher up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This. Listen. This ultimately. This. Right. This. This ultimately became the Harvey Weinstein story. Is ultimately an X-ray into abuse of power yeah. and how all of the high-priced lawyers, the private investigators, and secret settlements and other tools that are at the disposal of the powerful when they want to cover up misconduct. Yes. And so there's, there's this, that's, you know, this, that's why the, it's also a story that demands broader change beyond sort of bringing one person to justice. I mean, I think what we're looking at, we really, you know, with that first story, we had been able to connect some of the dots. And in reporting this book, we had really been able to bring together so many other pieces of the puzzle, the machinery that was in place to silence women, the individuals and institutions who became complicit in abuse. And those are questions that extend way beyond Weinstein into all of our workplaces, into all of our families, into all of our, I mean, there, there, there were really sort of systemic issues and cultural issues here that went so far beyond Weinstein. Are there any questions? Yes, go to, please go to the microphone. We take three, I think, yeah. Yeah. So I think you were alluding to this a little bit in terms of fast forwarding to the Me Too movement. You started to get a bit of a backlash and, and an impassioned debate as to uh, judicial proof and, you know, are you going too far? And that's going to ultimately do a disservice to the women who are abused and where do you draw the line and the Al Franken story, et cetera, et cetera. And I wonder if you could address that a little bit because mm -hmm, sure. I feel like that, that whole debate has also kind of gotten lost mm -hmm. where on the one hand you really want to make sure that all of this abuse comes to light and that the perpetrators are brought to justice and the people who have abused sure. their power lose that power. Um, you know, and then you also don't want to give cannon fodder to the other side that's saying, oh, you're just pointing fingers and all of these careers are yeah. being toppled for no reason. And I, I would be yeah. curious to hear what you have No, to say. yeah, no, listen, we, I mean, we have spent a lot of time thinking about this and reporting on it and writing about it in this book. And one of the you know, we, it was interesting for us to watch <clears throat> as the Me Too movement really took off and that phrase, believe women, took hold. And we understand, we understand why. We understand why activists in particular have been so drawn to that phrase. As journalists, we've worked really, Jody and I have worked really hard to tell the stories of women and help and make sure that they have voice in the pages of the news organizations that we've worked for. But we also are really quick to point out that that's not like a believe women phrase like that is, is never a phrase that we would adopt as journalists. Um, you know, when I was first getting my start as a journalist, I worked for a, a newspaper in Wisconsin, and my editor had a saying, a phrase above his desk, which was, if your mother tells you she loves you, check it out. Um, 
And I think that that really summarizes the perspective that we take when we're going into the sort of Me Too subjects that we, um, yes, believe that there has been sort of systems in place to silence women and it's really important to address those systems and to shatter the silence. But when it comes to reporting on serious allegations of sexual misconduct against you know, any, any particular person. When it comes to reporting on serious allegations against anybody, we are going to go through a very rigorous process before we publish those allegations. And in this book, we, you know, so much of the reporting, investigative reporting that we did took place, you know, off the record and behind the scenes. And we worked really hard to bring all of it onto the record so that readers could see exactly what we were doing step by step as we were seeking corroboration. You know, for example, you know, Gwyneth Paltrow, uh, you know, who, who told us the story of, of, of being preyed on by Weinstein when she was starting off, um, you know, her, when she was starting her career. You know, she, she told us the story. She said that not only had he tried to prey on her in a hotel room during a work meeting, but when, that she told her boyfriend at the time, Brad Pitt, and that Brad Pitt then confronted Weinstein, and then Weinstein came back to, to, to Gwyneth Paltrow with retaliation, basically threats of retaliation, saying, if you, make, if you tell anybody about this, I'm going like, to basically ruin your career. And so as she's telling us that story, we're saying, okay, Gwyneth, um, we're going to have to talk to Brad Pitt to make sure, to confirm your story, to corroborate your story. Um, the, we, you know, we did that with the famous actresses. We did that with the women, you know, the sort of more everyday women um, who had worked as lowly assistants in his, um, in, his, in his companies. We have a very, you know, a very set procedures and guidelines that we follow as investigative reporters when it comes to corroboration, when it comes to the other types of due diligence, when it comes to going to, you know, when it, when it means going to your subject to seek comment in the name of fairness and accuracy, even when that subject is coming at you with all these underhanded tactics and barging into the New York Times, we go through that process to make sure that we are producing a product and, and, and basically that we're producing a story that we think is fair and accurate. And so, you know, we think that when we, when we look around at what's happened with, you know, as the Me Too movement has taken off, we, re we think that there's really three questions that have not been resolved. It's like the kind of old rules of power, sex and power, were, like, have been washed away, and there's not consensus on what the new rules are supposed to be. And so, you know, we think that the first question, that there's three questions. The first is, you know, what is the scope of scrutiny, excuse me, what is the scope of behavior that's under scrutiny? Are we only talking about serious allegations of rape and sexual harassment, or are we talking about more nuanced encounters, like an uncomfortable hand on your shoulder in the workplace, or an awkward date? And how far back are we going? Are we going back to the, you know, to the 90s? Are we going back to the 80s? Are we going back to the 70s? And secondly, what's the process by which these allegations are being vetted? We really walk readers through the process that we have when we're doing this reporting, but when it comes to HR departments and when it comes to the court of public opinion, what are the protocols, what are the, what are the standards that we have to determine what's actually happened? And then third, what about the issue of accountability, the question of accountability? It's so easy to insist on accountability, but when it comes time to assigning accountability, it's much more difficult. And so we find that these, not only are these three really crucial questions unresolved, um, but that they often get scrambled. So you had brought up the case of Al Franken, this, you know, the U.S. Senator who resigned from the Senate following allegations of sexual misconduct against him. And almost from the moment he resigned, there was debate over whether or not that was the right thing to do before anybody had determined what he had actually done. And so, you know, we really think that it's not until there's consensus on these questions that we're going to be able to kind of move forward with a new set of rules that make, that make everybody feel like they're receiving adequate fairness and protection. Yeah. The next book. <laughs> the next book, right, yes, yeah. Well, all the three, these three questions uh, are part of the second part of your book, and that's the case of Christine Blasey Ford. Right because you describe very well and interesting and thriller-like what happened to you and Jody investigating Harvey Weinstein and publishing. But then the second half of the book you give to Christine Blasey Ford. That is the scientist who, uh, well, told that judge to be Kevin, Kevin or Brett Kavanaugh had, well, assaulted her, mm -hmm. more or less raped her. Yeah. 
why did you choose that story? Yeah. Well, so we were we had started to work on this book, and we kept we were starting to write this book, and we had started to write what had really happened behind the scenes of the Weinstein investigation um, in in the year that followed. And we were watching as the Me Too movement got more complicated and more messy, and we were wondering how can we report into this? How can we kind of do justice to how all of these new pressing questions and confusion that's arising? And so when we saw Christine Blasey Ford testify before the U.S. Senate Judiciary Committee, we realized that that was the story we wanted to tell. I mean, millions of people saw her testimony that day. Some people walked away thinking she was the hero of the Me Too movement. I mean, there were so many other people who came forward after watching her testify. People like Ellen DeGeneres, for example, finally came forward and told their own stories of abuse. It was like another wave of the dam breaking. But there were also just as many people who watched her testify and thought that she was the villain of the Me Too movement, a class, like proof that the Me Too movement had gone too far and that, it, that there was an overstretch. And so we really felt like we wanted to figure out how how she had gotten to Washington and learn more about her. And so we were lucky to have some unique access to her legal team the day that she testified. And then two months after, I did fly out to California and obtain the first interview with her. And as she started to talk, ultimately she gave us dozens of hours of interviews. We realized that the story of her, the behind the scenes story of her private path to testifying in Washington was so much more complicated than either side knew, that there were really so many other forces that came to bear, that this was just a private citizen who felt like she had a civic duty to share this information with the people who are in charge of making this, um, you know, making this decision about one of the most powerful positions in the United States. And what happened as she, you know, tried to come forward with that information became so so complicated and there were, you know, there were the political forces that came to bear on it. There were the individual lawyers who got involved. There were um, the broader cultural forces, the the Me Too activists who were trying to help bring it to light. And that there was the, the that there was a, actually a real person who kind of suffered through this process. Several times you write, she is naive. She's very naive. The, the word naive is... Mm -hmm several times used by you. Why? Why are you stressing that much that she was naive? Well, there was, there was one narrative. I mean, her critics came up with a narrative that she was that she had political motivations and that she had injected herself into this, you know, this, this nomination process in the 11th hour to derail his nomination. And that was far from the truth. I mean, when, you, when we went back to piece together what had really happened, it was clear that this was a woman who um, had carried around with her the wounds from this alleged sexual assault that had taken place in the 1980s when they were in high school. And while she had never reported it to authorities, she had told therapists about it. She had told her husband. She had told some friends and when she saw that he had been when she saw that he was on Trump's short list of uh, potential nominees to the Supreme Court that was the first time that she basically worked to try to get that information to her congresswoman uh, with the hopes that basically that she could that that information could get into the hands of the people who were making the decision so that they could choose somebody else and so um, and then at first no one reacts to it and it right exactly and there was in for a variety of reasons that didn't happen and so then he receives the nomination and she ultimately is trying to then then she ends up in this very difficult increasingly challenging position where she still wants to perform this civic duty and share this information but the stakes have gone have gotten so much higher and now it's really going to become a political ballot battle and um, probably one of the most politically polarized times in the United States when you're talking about the Supreme Court and a person who's going to assume a seat that could be a swing vote in abortion, probably the most charged issue in the United States. And so while she was, you know, Christine Blasey Ford is probably, you know, is, is extremely smart and um, she... Uh, you know, she speaks in the language of science. Uh, she, uh, you know, was not active on Twitter. She wasn't a particularly... She didn't. She didn't speak the language of sort of politics in Washington, and so and she hadn't even been particularly invested in the Me Too movement. She had done hashtag Me Too on her Facebook account and it. left it at that. She didn't. You know, she was when it came time to protest uh, Trump's election. She was in the streets marching to protest 
She was protesting cuts to scientific research. She and her friends were wearing gray hats, like knitted hats, to sort of represent uh, the gray matter of the brain as opposed to the pink pussy hats. And so um, she was just, she just did not, she was not politically charged. She was not, and she just was not, she didn't have the political sophistication. But is she, she in your book a metaphor for uh, the, the Me Too movement going wrong? Well, listen, I think that there's real, Me Too is, I, I think that she, I think especially in contrast to the Weinstein story, raised questions about what are the, what are the stories that really help shift culture? Is it something like the Weinstein investigation in which there was a clear pattern of behavior in which there was ultimately all these other documents of evidence, including the financial payoffs to women and the internal HR records from his own company? Um, and, you know, that was a story when it was published that, like, there was not a debate over what had happened. There was a debate of what, was, what should be done in response. You know, is it just stories like that that shift the culture, or is it somebody like Christine Blasey Ford showing up in Washington and saying, I'm going to, I'm not sure what the outcome's going to be here, but I think it's really important for me to tell my my personal experience of being sexually assaulted by this person in the 1980s, and no, I didn't go to the police at the time, and no, I haven't reported this to any formal channels. To but this, when you are considering putting this person on the highest court in the land, I feel compelled to tell you what happened to me. I, I, I don't know the answer, but I think that this book sort of examines some of those questions about what is it, what is it that shifts the culture? What is it that sort of breaks through? What is it that challenges our cultural attitudes that helps bring consensus, that helps fracture us? Anyone in the audience, please go to the microphones. <laughs> Tumar, Carola. I know her. <laughs> uh, Carola. Thanks for your really interesting talk. Uh, I'm a journalist uh, for NRC, a colleague of uh, Joyce. Together with my uh, other colleague Esther Rosenberg, we are working on a story uh, just like yours. So therefore I'm um, really interested in um, how you found this uh, account manager, because he seems in such mm -hmm. a... Yeah, <laughs> right, and yes, how, exactly. At no. what point did you know that he would be friendly towards mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. and not go talk to her? Yeah, it was a risk, it was a risk. And I wish, I wish Jody was here because she's the one who... Um, She's the one who ultimately reached out to Erwin Ryder. We debated whether or not she should, and in the end, she did. Um, there were some of the people who had worked in his companies who were saying, listen, you should actually reach out to the accountant. He hates Harvey Weinstein. He'll talk to you. <laughs> People actually even said that about Bob Weinstein and his brother. And we'd sit there and we'd say, okay, should we, you know, should we call? Is it too risky? And ultimately, we decided that she would contact Irwin. I debated whether or not to contact Bob. I, I, decide, I ultimately decided against it. I said, I don't care how much a brother hates his, I don't, I don't care how much he hates his brother. I just don't believe that family is going to turn on family. And um, I think that that was probably right. Um, but... Uh, in the case of Erwin Ryder, when Jody reached out to him by email, he did agree to meet with her. He agreed to meet with her in a restaurant, actually not too far from the Weinstein Company office in Tribeca, the, the Tribeca neighborhood in, in New York. And when Jody showed up to meet him um, for their first meeting in this kind of dark bar, she wondered whether or not he might he might have been a plant, you know, if he was actually, when we, you know, we were on the lookout for private investigators and other people who were working on Harvey's behalf. But as soon as she sat down and he started to talk, she realized that he was, in fact, it really did seem like he had been genuinely concerned and had mounting fears about what Weinstein was doing to women in the company. And he was one of the first people to say, you know, at that point she was asking, like, what do you know about secret settlements that were paid to women in the 1990s? And he was like, why do you keep asking about the 1990s? Why aren't you asking about 2015? And ultimately, you know, ultimately after a series, so he would basically feed her information at night and then during the day we would report it out. And he was talking in fragments and, and oftentimes with initials, like, you know, using initials like EN and LC and sort of like dropping little crumb, crumbs of information. And during the day we were taking those crumbs and trying to report them out. And a lot of it was turning out to be true. And then there was this night where finally she showed up and um, she had heard talk, she, Irwin had made references to this memo that 
Lauren O'Connor, a junior executive at the company, had written in 2015 and had submitted to HR documenting allegations of sexual harassment and abuse against Weinstein. And so Jody showed up and she basically... <sighs> Irwin was aware of the allegations... Erwin was very concerned about Harvey, how Harvey was treating the employees in the company, but he didn't necessarily grasp that Harvey had actually hurt actresses. And so when Jody showed up for this meeting, she had typed out one of the accounts of one of like the horrifying encounters that one of the actresses had had in a hotel room, and she handed it. She read. She read it to him, and he said, "Oh my goodness, I you know I didn't realize that that was also happening." And so she said, "Listen, I'd really like to see this memo that you've talked about." And so ultimately, he said he got out his phone and he pulled up the memo on his phone and he put it down on the put it down on the chair and he said, "I'm going to the little boy's room." And he went to the little boy's room and she sat there and she said, "Okay, he's basically telling me to copy this memo." And so she got out her phone and was you know she couldn't forward it to herself from his phone because that would leave a paper trail. So she sat there with her phone taking taking pictures and when he came and then she put her phone away and when when he came back you know she just said you know thanks so much Erwin she didn't make a big deal of it and within minutes she was in the bathroom herself forwarding the mem you know forwarding the pictures to me and Rebecca Corbett our editor and that was a you know that was one of the, the you know the really significant moments that was the moment where we thought oh my goodness these are things that have been happening in his company as we started to scroll through this remarkable memo that Lauren O'Connor had written in 2015 that was when we were like oh my goodness we've got to, you know we if we if we're not able to publish this story he's going to go on to hurt more people question Hi. So first, I just want to say thank you so much, Megan. All of what you have to say is really fascinating. Could and you please second, talk more into the microphone? Yeah. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, I have to stand on my tippy toes. Yeah. Um, so second, I was wondering, you know, earlier you mentioned about your young daughter and Jody's child as well. You know, what is it going to be like for them when they grow up? So as a student, as a university student, along with many others um, here today, I was wondering if you have any advice for us. You know, everybody always says we have potential to really change the future, our generation. Mm -hmm. So what yeah, would you have yeah. to say on the topic? Yeah, I mean, listen, we, like, we think that, um, I think, well, one, to believe in change and the power to change things. Uh, you know, this, we encountered so many we encountered so many kind of dark, cynical forces in the course of our reporting, but we also encountered a lot of inspiring courage and bravery and um, integrity. And, you know, in the end, these, the, the sources, the brave women who chose to go on the record, they didn't have to do that. That wasn't, I mean, sometimes they, there can be an assumption that all of the, the sort of Me Too momentum was inevitable. And what we do in the book is we really try to plunge people back into ground zero and say, actually, there were, the deci there were specific decisions made by specific people, whether it was Erwin Ryder, the accountant, whether it was Ashley Judd, one of the, fir the first actress to go on the record, whether it was Lauren Madden, who was another one of the first women to go on the record. These were choices that individuals made that helped not only make this story happen, but helped shift the culture and help bring about societal change. And so in the end, and especially at a time when things are, can feel so fractured and so stuck, like the, the, the facts won. You know, these individual, these brave individual, primarily women, made more of a difference than they ever could have imagined. So. Thank you. Yeah. But do you really believe there has shifted something? Isn't it just a momentum? I'm so afraid that it's, it's very huge and things seem to change, but yeah. like, now we have this big interview of Prince Andrew, and mm -hmm. it's very big. But mm -hmm. in the end, you see all these very powerful men just claiming their right to misconduct. Mm -hmm. And do you really think that that will change? Mm -hmm. I think that there's no... Listen, I, it, you know, more than two years in, it seems like it can feel like everything has changed and nothing has changed at the same time. 
there's no question that there's been that there was very significant change. I mean, to watch all to watch the silence shatter and to watch all these victims come forward with their own stories um, of abuse and harassment was, and to watch the the accountability that followed, to watch powerful men from a variety of industry ousted from those perches of power was incredible. And there, you can't question that that was meaningful, significant change. Now, I think the question is, where are we going next? You know, where are we going to be able to answer some of these pressing questions? Are we going to build consensus? Are we going to see systemic change that goes beyond one individual? individual predator, you know, either going to jail or losing his job. I mean, when, to go back to these secret settlements that were used by alleged predators like Weinstein to cover their tracks and go on and hurt more people, those secret settlements are being still being signed every single day um, in cases of sexual harassment and sexual assault. And so I think that, you know, that some of those, you know, we, once again, we as journalists stepped in where other institutions had failed. We can't change everything. We can't we can't pass the laws, we can't change the HR policies, but as reporters, we really also feel like you can't solve a problem that you can't see. And so we think that it's, as journalists, you know, the best thing that we can do is to continue to report and help bring things to light. Question. Um, sorry, in a similar vein to the last um, student question, um, I'm an American student. I'm in the education system in the U.S., um, and I've done like a lot of work um, for sexual assault on my campus, um, but I still can't probe the bigger structural issue um, that the physical institutions themselves are also don't want to have like backlash um, in media based off of things that have happened um, regarding sexual assault and rape inside of their campuses. So I, I want to ask you, how do you think that there's, if there is a way, how do you kind of deal with those bigger structural institutions as such a small <laughs> mm -hmm. person mm -hmm. um, besides having a club, besides having a speak out, besides having a workshop, because these are all things that I've done, yet the greater institution and the president of my institution still does not see a need or a desire to change the culture. Mm -hmm. So what do you, what do you think is, uh, is a way to, to probe that? Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, good for you for being so active around this issue on your college campus. That's... You know, when I was in college, I actually helped organize a take, I mean, this was yeah, take back a long time ago. Yeah, this is a long, many decades ago. But um, you know, I helped organize a take back the night rally, which was really meaningful for me personally to be involved in something like that. And I know it didn't change, uh, it didn't necessarily bring about any systemic change, but I felt like it still was a really important moment of empowerment and um, to at least to communicate to the broader campus community that there are people who care about these issues and are paying attention and are, are going to speak out against it. And so um, I don't, you know, I don't know the details of what's happened on your campus and can't speak to those. But I don't, I don't know if there is a campus newspaper, if there are student journalists who are doing reporting around these issues that can, could maybe go one step further to just, the, you know, the activism around it. But reporting into what the administration is doing or not doing, um, I think. I mean, you're, listen, you're talking to a journalist. I'm going to always, you know, I'm going to often steer you to, to, journal, to the journalism option, but I would just keep that, I would keep that in mind okay. moving Thank forward. Thank you. Yep, thanks. Um, I'm a J school professor here in the Netherlands, mm -hmm. and I teach a lot about um, women in journalism, and I was wondering, reading your book, what difference has it made that you and Jody, as women in investigative journalism, researched and produced this story? Mm -hmm. Why weren't it men before mm -hmm. who made this investigative journalism? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, we get asked that question a, a lot, and we're not going to sort of lie and say that we don't, that our gender played no role in our reporting on this story. I, oftentimes, Listen, a lot of the women that we report, reported about, um, a lot of the women who came forward with, you know, allegations against Harvey Weinstein or, you know, certainly in the case of Christine Blasey Ford felt like they were our cohort. They were, we were often sitting across from women who are 
our same age, um, of the same generation, and uh, we obviously just had, um, there were some kind of natural affinities that come with being women of a certain age and having sort of similar experiences, even beyond, um, uh, you know, a, a harassment or assault. Uh, but I also think that it's important to know that there were really significant men in this investigation um, from sources like Erwin Ryder up through the editors at the, you know, some of the top... Our, our editor, Jody and I, our investigations editor, Rebecca Corbett, was one of the first women to break into the masthead, the top people at the new editorial leadership at the New York Times. But the, there were two other, the executive editor, Dean Baquet, and another editor, Matt Purdy, were very instrumental in this investigation as well, helping to push it forward. And, you know, within a week of our story being published, Ronan Farrow published his story uh, for The New Yorker and did a lot of um, really significant reporting around this issue and has continued to do a lot of significant reporting on this issue. So I don't think that it necessarily breaks down along neat gender lines every step of the way. Thank you and, and congratulations on your Pulitzer. Thanks. Um, my question is about Mr. Ryder's motivation and I think follows nicely on the professor's previous question. Do I remember this right? I, from a review of your book, I think in the Philadelphia Inquirer, saying that Mr. Ryder was motivated in large part, not just what I read was, in large part uh, out of concern for his own daughter mm -hmm. and that his daughter should yeah. grow up in a much better, safer world. So it's not just hatred for his own yeah. boss, but a concern uh, yeah. of this kind. And if that's so, I think that's a point of leverage, I think, to grow this movement ever oh, so sure. much larger. Yeah, there's, you're absolutely right. I mean, Erwin had a daughter um, who, I, you know, sort of who's a young adult. Uh, and he, so he, in 2014 and 2015, started talking to her about the concerns that he had about the boss. And she was really you know, she really pressured him and said, you've got to do something about this. You can't just stand by and watch this happen and not do anything. And so in that case, you know, a daughter played a significant role in a source's decision to participate in our investigation. That also, that, that also was the case with Laura Madden, um, the first sort of non-actress to go on the record in our story. She was leading a quiet life in Wales. Uh, she's the, she was a stay-at-home mom. Um, in fact, she was preparing, she was preparing to go under surgery for breast cancer when she had to decide whether or not to go on the record for our story. And um, as she tells it, she gathered her teenage daughters together and for the first time told them what, she had, what had happened to her when she was in her early 20s, not much older than them, working for Weinstein. And they were, what happened next totally surprised her. Not only were they extremely supportive about her going on the record and proud of her for that, they started opening up to her about their own experiences and the experience of their friends. And you know, when she finally sent us a, an email uh, saying that she was going, prepared to be a source, she said it was because she didn't want her daughters to grow up in a place where that type of bullying uh, misconduct was acceptable. So. I think there are many men, or I'd like to think there are many men who, who could be motivated in the same way and be allies. Uh, oh, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah, but I, I, I really, it concerns me that only men that would have teenage daughters would act. I mean... <laughs> Yeah. That's a very cynical way of thinking. Mm -hmm. I, I hope that there would be men who would act to protect these yeah. women. Listen, I think whatever the avenue in is a good thing. And, you know, it's, it's you know, the more men, I'm so thrilled. Like, listen, this is, I'm so thrilled when I, you know, when we've been doing, when we've been talking about the books in front of live audiences, I'm so thrilled to see that there are not just women and women of very different generations, but also men who are coming to these events and who are participating in this conversation, who participated in the reporting, the original reporting, who participated in the reporting of this book, and have been and are part of the public conversation around it. And I, I want to read the last sentence of the book. Or maybe you can read it. Okay. Well, this was interesting. So <laughs> 
Oh, this is well the right before the final. Yeah. The epilogue is something else. Yeah. So this. Oh my goodness. Oh man. This still brings. I mean, this this still sends like sh um, shivers down my spine. So. When we were reporting on Christine Blasey Ford and what happened to her, this kind of epic journey that she had to Washington and what happened to her on her way to Washington and what happened to her after in those, that week or two afterwards, um, you know, there was, we also were tracking what else was happening around Me Too at the time. And our colleagues in the opinion section of the New York Times did an interesting call out to men right around, I guess this was the fall of 2018, asking them to submit if they had any stories about basically perpetrate, being perpetrators of sexual assault or sexual harassment and if their feelings had changed in the past year. And they got hundreds and hundreds of responses. And these were men, some put their names to it, some didn't, who were saying, you know, I did this terrible thing when I was 22, I did this terrible thing when I was 16, I did this terrible thing when because I was 45. I thought, because I thought I had to. It's, it's right, well, because I thought I had to, and they were really, you could just, in these letters that they were sending in, you could see them working so hard to unpack what they had done and why they had done it. And um, there was even a message, and we, this is sort of concludes the, the last, you know, there, like, for example, there was a man, Tom, you know, one of the men wrote, you know, I think conquering her sexually was something I expected I needed to do. He wrote of forcing his hand up a girl's skirt at a prom in 1980. And there was a Terry Wheaton, who, is now, who at that point was now 82 years old, who recounted forcibly kissing a classmate around 1952. And he closed saying, I'm sorry, Diane. It's such a sweet line to finish your book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's very nice. Yeah. I think we have time for one more question, or else Tracy will throw us out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> one more question. Okay, thank you. First of all, I wanted to say thank you for your reporting and um, to con congratulate you on the Pulitzer as others have. Um, I'm going to be honest and say this is going to be very hard for me to articulate because one, I'm aware there are video cameras back there and I don't want to give too many identifying details. Um, and I definitely don't want to have this considered something that's on the record. But um, I'm sort of thinking about you know, the book being titled She Said and the question of who can speak and the ways in which um, in being introduced, the category of woman has been um, seen as sort of this coherent or homogenous category, and I want to problematize um, the ways in which we may all be women, but we are not all women equally, and um, how some of us have privilege that others don't have, especially when it comes to the ability to speak and to be believed and to have people stand in solidarity with us, as well as the kinds of differential retaliation that can take place. Two of the earlier speakers said that they were students, and um, I'm actually now back in school um, finishing a doctorate that I was not able to finish because of reporting harassment and being very severely retaliated against but because of issues of racism and colorism as well as class, the kinds of um, retaliation that I had to deal with, um, you know, while it did include a gag order, um, involved legal harassment that went through accusing me of being a violent criminal who had assaulted the harasser. And um, when the, the Blasey Ford um, hearings occurred, you know, it was a very difficult period for me because I actually went to Yale undergrad. And mm. um, similar to earlier this year when the varsity blues scandal broke, um, there are ways in which, you know, elite schools like Yale are spoken of as though they are some sort of um, protective shield against certain life outcomes, which really they're not. Mm -hmm. um, and when um, Professor Blasey Ford spoke out, there was also the um, example of Debbie Ramirez and mm -hmm. discussion about how differently she had been um, positioned at Yale because of being Puerto Rican and working class. So, you know, I guess the question I want to ask is to what extent is Me Too largely as it's um, 
as it's been reported on, and I, I don't want to say that this is you, but, you know, insofar mm -hmm. as who's come forward mm -hmm. and who's had the opportunity to speak and mm -hmm. um, who's gotten to be seen as representing sure. the category of women, you know, to what extent is this very much about mm -hmm. um, white women mm -hmm. and, you know, upper class white women mm -hmm. in particular, yeah. and how do we move past that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, well, th well, thank you so much for getting up and, and telling us also a little bit about your experience. I'm so sorry to hear that you've had, uh, it sounds like, uh, just an extremely painful experience from start to finish. And so if you ever want to talk more about it, um, you know, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, uh, so I think, listen, I think you are voicing a um, legitimate concern. And I will tell you that actually when I first started the Weinstein investigation, I myself had, you know, Jody had started to, Jody had started it before me while I was on maternity leave. And when I was talking at first about some of the sex crimes reporting that I had done when I was starting off as a reporter in Chicago, that was reporting on like primarily black and brown women um, and, um, uh, you know, from lower socioeconomic um, backgrounds, that, that those were the women that I had done a lot of reporting on and reporting with in my, in, in my pre, you know, when I, in the previous stories that I had done. And so when Jody, and listen, this is, this is often, and, and one of the kind of pillars of investigative reporting is that you help give voice, is to help give voice to the voiceless. So when I came back to the New York Times after maternity leave and Jody had, was filling me in on some of the initial reporting that she had done, I will confess that I had a hard time wrapping my head around like a Gwyneth Paltrow as being a victim who was in need of help of the New York Times. I just, I really could not, it just, I very had a very hard time conceiving of her that way. And I've told Gwyneth Paltrow that, by the way. Um, and um, she, you know, one of the things that Jody said and one of the things that I think turned out to be the case is you know, that these famous actresses actually served as a reminder that nobody was immune from sexual harassment and sexual assault and that it could, you know, that it could happen and did happen to everybody and that the fears that went along with speaking out applied pretty universally across the board. And so are there other additional, you know, are there obviously, are there other additional challenges and um, sort of systemic you know, sort of systemic oppression <laughs> that certain women face in this country, absolutely. Like is, I mean, should the Me Too movement ever be uh, viewed as an exclusively like white well-off um, movement? I certainly hope not. I certainly hope not. And that's been, you know, we've done reporting into all different industries and women of all different backgrounds and have really tried to make sure that our reporting is as inclusive as possible. And it's not just the, you know, it's not just the individual experiences. It's not just these individual predators. It's the, it is the systems. It is whether it's universities or, um, you know, it, other companies or the, criminal justice system. I mean, there are so many different things to unpack here and to identify. And so I'm so heartened to hear that you have spoken up and that you have fought back. And, um, you know, if there, as I said, if there's ever an opportunity, if you ever are interested in talking more about your experience, you know, we would, we would welcome the chance to hear about it. So thank you.